Richard Bushman in his uh, uh, keynote address this morning said that he didn't have anything original to offer, no original new research, but a summary of what was known about the state of the um, subject, and that certainly is true of my talk here as well. I did, though, too late to, to get it in the program, think of an extremely clever title, and, and it's Hermetically Sealed. <laughs> Joseph Smith's Relationships with Hermeticism and Freemasonry. That might be the best thing I have to say. <laughs> Six weeks after he received a ritual priesthood endowment from Joseph Smith on the fourth day of May, 1842, in Nauvoo, Illinois, Heber Kimball wrote to his fellow apostle, Parley Pratt, who was proselytizing in England, we have received some precious things through the prophet Joseph Smith on the priesthood that would cause your soul to rejoice. I cannot give them to you, for they are not to be written, so you must come and get them for yourself. In the very next sentence, Kimball continued, we have organized a lodge here of Masons. He said that Joseph Smith was first among them and uh, followed by nearly 200 others, including most of the apostles. And then Heber said, there is a similarity of priesthood in masonry. Brother Joseph says masonry was taken from priesthood, but has become degenerated, but many things are perfect. There is a similarity between the ritual priesthood endowment of Mormonism and some ceremonies of Freemasonry. There are also similarities, as John Brooks showed in his influential 1994 book, The Refiner's Fire, between Joseph Smith's thought and Hermeticism. Granting these similarities as my first premise, I want to explore their nature in order to assess these two claims. The first claim is that the similarities between the temple and masonry are so apparent and overwhelming that some dependent relationship cannot be denied meaning that masonry provided the immediate inspiration for the endowment. Those are the words of uh, Professor Durham. The second claim is Hermeticism was fundamental, these are the words of John Brooke, fundamental to the origins of Mormon cosmology and explains the more exotic features of the inner logic of Mormon theology. Both of these conclusions, in my judgment, go beyond what evidence allows. A logical leap is required to bridge the evidentiary gap between resemblance, which I grant, and dependence, which is assumed rather than proved. Even so, carefully considering Joseph Smith's thought in relationship to hermetic ideas and masonry, enlarges our understanding of the potential resources at his disposal and suggests ways they may have influenced him and he them. I reject what I regard as a fundamentalist assumption that Joseph Smith's restoration was out of nothing but that does not lead inevitably to the alternative ideas that, were, that I just restated. Joseph's thought may have been shaped by hermetic ideas and he was undoubtedly influenced by Freemasonry, but too much has simply been assumed regarding the nature of these relationships, followed by flat denials of any relationship by some believers. I want to know where the evidence leads. A difficulty in determining that is that Hermeticism's amorphous mystical character does not yield easily to definitions. It is ostensibly the teachings of the legendary Hermes Trismegistus, uh, I don't even know how to pronounce it, Trismegistus, thrice great it means, whom various traditions place as prophet king among the oldest Egyptian dynasties, a successor to Enoch and Noah, a contemporary with Abraham, uh, as a source of his cosmology, some claim, or a contemporary of Moses, others claim. Some Christian fathers regarded him as a proto-Christian prophet in possession of what some Renaissance Catholic philosophers later called the Prisca Theologia, meaning the original universal theology. Ideas attributed to this Hermes are written in a body of texts known corporately as Hermetica. Uncertainty surrounds all stages of the Hermeticus history, from the writers of the original manuscripts, to the first collators of transcribed versions, to the seemingly arbitrary naming and organization of the texts themselves. Wayne Schumacher, author of The Occult Sciences in the Renaissance, wrote that the dating of the Hermetica, Hermetica is an immensely complicated problem, which must be left to specialists in classical philosophy and religion. But the problem has proven too much for them, too. There's no consensus, but the prevalent informed opinion divides the Hermetic writings into four groups. I'm only going to mention the two that are relevant to this 
subject. First is the Corpus Hermeticum, composed of dialogues, some between a divine being and Hermes, and others in which Hermes converses with his son or someone else, divided into chapters or books written in Greek and variously numbered anywhere between 17 and 28, depending on the authority. Some of these are coherent texts addressed to an obvious theme or concern, and others are fragmentary and unfocused. And the second of these bodies of hermetic writings is called the Asclepius, a Latin version of what appears to be original Greek discourse that alludes to magic, alchemy, and astrology, which are topically unusual compared to the Hermetica's otherwise philosophical ramblings, but very popular texts in Renaissance and early modern Europe, and the ones that mostly concern John Brooks' claim. No known Hermetic texts date earlier than the 14th century, though fragments of the Corpus Hermetica appear in works written around 500 AD, and some have hypothesized that Hermetic texts were compiled into the first forms of the current corpus circa 900 or 1000 AD. In the late 15th century, a Byzantine monk uh, um, uh, brought Hermetic texts to the attention of the Medici family in Florence, and they patronized a 1471 publication. Much of the corpus was first translated into English in 1650, but only after a Geneva-born philologist uh, published in 1614 his analysis, which placed the historical origin of the writings in the second or third century rather than in a much earlier Egyptian golden age, as many Renaissance call scholars and others had thought. There have been several critical editions of the Hermetica published, or parts of it, each identifying unsolvable source criticism problems. So after all that, uh, we just simply end with a caution to proceed carefully with the term hermeticism, since neither John Brooke or I can be very precise about its definitions. A hermetic text called the Emerald Tablet is a source of the maxim that what is below corresponds to what is above. And this text and others like it inspired Renaissance and early modern alchemists, including Isaac Newton, to quest for the philosopher's stone that promised the power to transmute base metals into precious ones. The philosopher's or sorcerer's stone was not so much a finite object buried in a well or under a tree near Buffalo as it was the elix elixir of alchemy, the magical chemical combination that could catalyze the transmutation of metals and by extension of lives. This hermetic idea is thus much more than simply a ploy to wealth. It assumes an optimistic vision of human nature, one in which humanity is divine, or like lead can be transmuted into gold, can become divine. Hermetic ideas have little, if anything, to say directly about the biblical account of Adam's fall, but they assert that mankind can recover Adam's primal status. And the metaphor for this recovery is marriage. John Brooke expressed this marriage metaphor when he wrote the stone, also known as the quintessence or the prima material, was the central element in an elaborate alchemical symbology of divine perfection produced by alchemical marriage, allegorized as the mating, fusion, death, and resurrection of philosophical sulfur and mercury, the sun and the moon, the alchemical king and queen. Given hermetic links to magical stones, buried treasures, esoteric knowledge, and human transcendence via divine marriage, Brooks' thesis is intriguing. He asserted in the refiner's fire that Joseph Smith began his engagement with the supernatural world as a village conjurer who became a prophet, who later became a Christian hermetic magi in the Renaissance tradition. As evidence, Brooks cites Joseph's early use of magical stones in search of both material treasure and esoteric knowledge, rumors of counterfeiting in both Kirtland and Nauvoo, and later emphasis on divine marriage as the course to recovering the divine power and perfection possessed by Adam before the fall. And, Brooke asserts, Joseph Smith made this journey with the assistance of the revived Hermeticism that Brooke finds in Freemasonry. As with Hermeticism, Freemasonry's history is much younger than its mythology suggests. 
The earliest known Masonic document, the Regius Manuscript, the first of more than 100 known versions of a founding constitution for a Masonic guild, dates to around 1390. These documents tell a legendary story of stonemasonry originating in Babylon and of its introduction to Egypt by Abraham. The earliest known minutes of a Masonic lodge, the Lodge of Edinburgh, date to July 31, 1599. And depending on how typical they were, they may indicate that Masons at that time were primarily concerned with regulating those who practiced the trade. Later minutes show that by the 1630s, there were non-Masons admitted to lodges in Scotland and by 1641 in England. Speculative Masons, as these more genteel newcomers came to be known in contrast to actual or operative Masons, seem to have overtaken Masonry in the 18th century, transforming it from a trade union into a gentleman's fraternity in the process. The existing evidence suggests that in this process, 1737 to be precise, Masons began telling each other their Genesis story. Our ancestors, the Crusaders, the story went, gathered together from all parts of Christendom in the Holy Land. They were the holy architects, warrior princes, who designed to enliven, edify, and protect the living temples of the Most High, who discovered the ancient books inscribed by Solomon, replaced in the temple by Zerubbabel at the direction of Cyrus, rediscovered after the relief of Jerusalem, preserving our maxims and our mysteries in the Masonic lodges of Europe. Later versions of this tradition specify that the Knights Templar preserved the mysteries and that Moses had originally learned them in Egypt. Not sure how to take that. <laughs> Masonry is many things, including fundamentally a conservative but adaptable, ritually based community bound by fidelity to God and brotherhood. These values are enacted by Masons in lodge meetings where the brief biblical account of Hiram of Tyre, a widow's son of the tribe of Naphtali, according to 1 Kings 7, is ritually enlarged. Solomon charges Hiram to build the temple. Hiram refuses to reveal the word of the master mason to some of his subordinates and is murdered for his fidelity. Emulating Hiram, masons ritually advance by degrees from entered apprentice to fellow craft to master mason using gestures, esoteric words, and ritual clothing. There are few similarities between the basic sacred spaces and narratives of masonry and Nauvoo Mormonism, more similarities in the basic rituals, and more still in the Masonic order of the Royal Arch, consisting of several more degrees beyond Master Mason. The Royal Arch can be traced historically to the 1740s in Ireland and 1750s in America. It seems to have been developed to resolve the tension in the unfinished story of Hiram, who died without revealing the Master Mason's word. The Royal Arch ritual tells initiates how the word was recovered by Mason knights working with trowel in one hand and sword and, buck and buckler in the other during construction of the second temple. They came to an underground vault or crypt under the ninth arch wherein was discovered a cubicle or white stone or metal plate or triangle upon which appeared the ultimate great Masonic secret. In American Royal Arch chapters, there are nine officers, including three who preside over the others. The highest of these three in the American version of the ritual re represents the high priest in Jerusalem in the time of Zerubbabel, and past high priests constitute an order of high priesthood. Those who receive the Royal Arch degrees pass through a series of veils into the Holy of Holies in space reminiscent of the Israelite tabernacle. The highest degree conferred by a royal arch chapter makes its recipient an anointed member of the holy order of the high priesthood based on a ritual history of Melchizedek. I began my talk by affirming that there is similarity between hermetic ideas, Freemasonry, and Joseph Smith's Mormonism, but I couldn't conclude that hermeticism explains the more exotic features of the inner logic of Mormon theology, or that there is a dependent relationship between temple and Masonic ritual. Elevating those theories to demonstrable facts would require evidence that Mormonism followed hermetic ideas and masonry temporally, that they correlate beyond coincidence, and that there's clear evidence of cause and effect. 
what David Hackett Fisher called a presumptive agency which connects them. Both hermetic ideas and Freemasonry obviously have the right temporal relationship to Mormonism, but Mormonism's correlation to hermeticism seems weak, whereas its correlation to Freemasonry is strong. Brooke argues that they are the same thing, that Freemasonry was informed by hermeticism and funneled it into Mormonism. For the Mormon theology of human divinization to emerge, Brooks said, a sectarian predisposition to the miraculous would require an 18th century infusion of hermetic knowledge from the German mid-Atlantic, from the money-digging counterfeit nexus, and from Freemasonry. Brooks' argument that hermeticism was not merely analogous but antecedent to uh, Mormonism is simply not credible for several reasons, in my judgment. One is that the parts of Masonry that are most like Nauvoo Mormonism are not at all like the hermetic ideas that Brooke identifies as essential in Nauvoo Mormonism, divine marriage, divinization, and the unity of spirit and matter. One's competence diminishes in Brooks' argument in proportion to the number of qualifiers that multiply page by page, even if Brooke didn't concede in a note that he depends on speculation and inference. The phenomena he observes are at least as explicable in terms of common cause as in terms of cause and effect. As a number of reviewers noted in various ways, Brooke too narrowly conceived of the cultural and theological resources available to Joseph Smith which led to an overstated argument. To Brooke, hermeticism is not just one of several contributing factors to the essence of Mormonism, it is that without which Joseph Smith's Mormonism would not have been. Supported by Val Rust's documentation of the radical beliefs of some ancestors of early Mormons, Brooke's argument proves no more than that Joseph Smith and others descended from ancestors who encountered and sometimes thought hermetic ideas, along with a host of other ideas deemed radical by the magisterial reformers. Brooke asserts that hermeticism fused with Christianity in the Renaissance, was exported from England to America by radical New Englanders, and was transmitted from them to Joseph Smith by links like Mary Eastie, one of the accused witches in Salem in 1692, who married an uncle of Joseph's third great-grandfather. Hermeticism has the right temporal relationship to have shaped the origins of Mormon cosmology or the more exotic features of its Nauvoo theology, but not enough substantial correlation and no evidence of direct cause and effect. As Richard Bushman observed in his review, Refiner's Fire is not only a history of the occult, it is itself a cult in requiring secret transmission of key ideas. In the end, there's nothing to hold Brooks' case together but a loose collection of malleable ideas that circulated widely along with other ideas, some of which have striking similarities to Mormon ideas. Arguments like this overstate similarities, understate differences, and oversimplify cause and effect. Hermetic marriage transmuted man and woman into a genderless atom where Mormon marriage exalted a gendered couple. Hermeticism made no distinction between matter and the divine. Matter came from spirit and would return whence it came. Mormon matter was not created or made and will endure forever. A revelation in the Corpus Hermetica begins with Hermes imploring mind. I will not shrink from speaking as the thought has come to me, Hermes declares. Many men have told me many and diverse things concerning the universe and God, and yet I have not learned the truth. I ask you, therefore, Master, to make this matter clear to me. You and you alone, I shall believe, if you will show me the truth about it. And mind then obliges Hermes and says, Hearken then, my son, and I will tell you how things are as the God in the universe. Look upon things through me and contemplate the cosmos as it lies before your eyes. Well, here are some unmistakable parallels with texts that Joseph Smith produced. One thinks of the books of Moses and Abraham, of Nephi, of Joseph's own visions and dialogic revelations, but one just as readily, maybe more so, associates these parallels with biblical texts that were much more accessible to Joseph and much more closely related textually to those he produced. If hermetic ideas were diffused in Joseph's cultural air or perchance believed by a woman who married an uncle of a distant ancestor, the Bible was the heir 
full of texts that Joseph reflected on again and again, of words and concepts that demonstrably occupied Joseph's mind and catalyzed his revelations. The angels that appeared to Joseph offered Christian forgiveness. They quoted and commented on the Old and New Testaments. It's hard to imagine Moroni, as Joseph gave him to us, saying, as mind does to Hermes, God contains within himself the cosmos, and himself, and all that is. It is as thought which God thinks, and all things that are contained in him. It is true that toward the end of the dialogue, mind summarizes, if then you do not make yourself equal to God, you cannot apprehend God, for like is known by like. The line evokes Joseph's celebrated King Fall at discourse and passages in the vision of the heavenly glories. But that slice is the extent of the similarity. The bulk of this particular hermetic revelation is the kind of stuff Joseph told Orson Hyde to stop preaching. There's so much more intertextuality between Joseph's priesthood temple revelations and the books of Hebrews and Revelation, for example, than there is with the Hermetica. Joseph explained eternal marriage relationships in terms of Genesis and Matthew and baptism for the dead in Pauline and Johannine terms. The links between Masonry and Mormonism are much more substantial, concrete, and documented. In December 1841, 18 Mormon Masons organized the Nauvoo Lodge. Non-Masons, non non Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon, applied for membership the following day. Illinois Grand Master Mason Abraham Jonas formalized the lodge on May, or March 15, 1842, installed its officers, and initiated Joseph Smith and Sidney as entered apprentices in the upper floor space above Joseph's Nauvoo store. The next day, Jonas passed Joseph and Sidney as fellow craft and raised them as master masons. Two days later, Joseph organized the Female Relief Society in the same space. In a subsequent address, Joseph urged the Relief Society sisters in Masonic terms to go into close examination of every candidate that they were going to fast, that the society should grow up by degrees. On May 3, 1842, Joseph enlisted Mormon Mason Lucius Scoville to fit up the same space preparatory to giving endowments to a few elders, which Joseph did the following day. Michael Homer, whose study of the similarities in masonry and Mormonism remains essential, noticed that Joseph endowed nine men on 4 May 1842, the same number needed to create a royal arch chapter of masonry. It's not clear whether or what, if anything, Joseph Smith knew of royal arch masonry by 1842. Apparently, there was a chapter functioning in Springfield by September of 1841, to which James Adams, one of those Joseph Smith endowed on May 4th, possibly belonged, and I emphasize the possibility, not the certainty. Though no known Mormon Masons from Nauvoo left known accounts of Royal Arch Masonry amid the several that do speak of becoming Master Masons. This, to me, seems the next area of very interesting inquiry. If anybody ever figures out what they knew about Royal Arch Masonry, that would be interesting to know. These and other similarities and links between Masonry and Mormonism make their relationship more than coincidental. Critics, beginning with John Bennett, have explained it as simple piracy. Joe Smith has violated his obligations as a Mason and has established a new order himself, John Bennett claimed, as early as July 1842. Joseph's own papers posit no explanation, but his associates acknowledged the relationship and explained it in terms of Joseph's prophetic ability to restore. The Mormon master Mason in charge of Joseph's lodge induction reportedly said that Joseph understood the ceremonies better than Masons. A few months before Hebrew Kimball wrote the same sentiment to Parley, Joseph's secretary, Willard Richards, said that masonry had its origin in the priesthood. Benjamin Johnson remembered Joseph telling him that Freemasonry, as at present, was the apostate endowments, as sectarian religion was the apostate religion. Not until the early 20th century, when all of the Nauvoo-era Mormon masons had passed, passed away, did Latter-day Saint leaders disavow the connection in the face of escalating charges of plagiarism? In his April 1974 presidential address to the Mormon History Association, Reed Durham asserted that the similarities between the temple and masonry are so apparent and overwhelming that some dependent relationship cannot be denied. 
Durham subsequently wished he could recall the word dependent. Since then, several studies more careful than his have revealed a relationship between Masonry and Mormonism that could be characterized as Joseph depending on Masonry as a point of departure. Joseph did not simply parrot the rituals of Freemasonry. Rather, in Samuel Brown's excellent recent analysis, Joseph translated them. Interpreting based on cues from the actual participants and the trajectory of Joseph's creative restoration, Brown describes the Nauvoo Endowment as an amplification and reform of Masonry. Just as the King James Bible had come to hide the plain and precious truths of antiquity, he said, so too had 19th century Masonry. The Hermetic Catechism and its ritual context were a hieroglyph for Smith to restore and interpret, an artifact that required the attention of a seer, a text in need of translation. I find that a very penetrating assessment. And that is the conclusion essentially reached by careful analysts of this relationship. David Berger argued that the pattern of resemblances was too great and the content of the endowment too unique to explain simply. Thus, he concluded, the temple ceremony cannot be explained as wholesale borrowing from masonry, neither can it be explained as completely unrelated to Freemasonry. Alan Roberts concluded that Joseph Smith's masonry was not a conventional one. He attempted to restore it in much the same way the gospel was restored. That is, he saw masonry like Christianity as possessing some important truths which could be beneficially extracted from what was otherwise an apostate institution. That's the end of Alan Roberts' quote. Michael Homer assessed by listening to the earliest Mormon masons to be endowed and by a close study of the ceremonies that the rituals of Freemasonry provided a starting point for the Mormon prophet's revelation of what Heber Kimball called true masonry. Joseph Smith eulogized himself. I think I'll skip over this last part and just conclude by saying that it seems best to conclude that Joseph Smith's relationship to hermetic and Masonic ideas is seen in his activity more than in ideas rendered artificially stagnant just to facilitate analysis. Joseph Smith is best discovered, in other words, I think, in the midst of what we might call the hermetic magic he worked on ideas more than in lists of ideas common to him in the hermetic tradition. The close followers he endowed, who were also Masons, were conscious of the catalog of similarities between the two rituals. Experiencing Joseph's translation of Masonic ritual made them feel endowed with power. Thank you. These uh, excellent little papers deserve uh, more attention than I can give them in a few minutes before we all scurry off for lunch. They each uh, have a, make an excellent contribution, uh, Richard and Michael elaborating and deepening our understanding of the Anthon incident, and uh, Steve talking about the place of hermeticism and masonry in uh, Joseph Smith's cultural growth. I want to do two things uh, today in my brief comment. The first is to uh, respond to what strikes me as significant and truly interesting in both of these papers, in all three of these papers, and then to s s point towards the fifth dimension in Mormon studies. All uh, Mormon studies proceeds like other kinds of history writing in the three dimensions of space and the fourth dimension of time, moving across through time and space. But as we read and as Latter-day Saints our history, we're also interested in the fifth dimension, how divine power is working in history. And these are places in our time, in our past, where we truly see God's power working. Turning to uh, Richard and Michael, Richard's paper really enriches our understanding of the characters to whom Martin Harris went, uh, Samuel Mitchell, Charles Anthon, and above all, uh, Luther Bradish. 
and uh, fills out a picture of what men, type of men they were, and especially uh, elaborating on Bradish's very interesting background and what he was to become in the course of his career. Michael has a number of rather striking and radical thoughts. I could feel the ground trembling as he was <laughs> speaking. Uh, one is that Joseph Smith didn't know how to translate. It wasn't obvious to him. He had to learn how to translate. It took quite a while. And secondly, that uh, when Martin Harris went off with these characters, they had no idea what those characters were. They did not think Egyptian because it's not until the Book of Mormon is translated that it's definitely known that they were Egyptian and that they were more likely interested in Indian languages or Mesoamerican languages or uh, something grounded in this, this continent. I uh, re responded to that second thought particularly because of my discovery um, uh, in these, uh, uh, this correspondence that, An that Anthon had with his friend in England, that the friend in England was uh, pressing Anthon to collect examples of Indian oratory. That was a very serious hobby of his, to collect speeches. And uh, this Englishman is saying, don't worry if they're authentic, just get as many as you can and we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll publish them. So when Samuel Mitchell says, who else might possibly know what these characters are, he may have thought of, Mit of Anthon not because he was a classicist in the making, but because he had this serious hobby of studying Indian, um, Indian oratory. As for the, the fifth dimension in uh, the, Anthon, um, the Anthon story, we began by arguing for quite some time now about what was the purpose of the trip. Was he going for corroboration? Uh, Richards talked about how the, and the pros and cons of that. Was he going, did Joseph want Anthon to corroborate that he had a true translation, just wanted to check up, or was he, as Michael is saying, really unsure of how to translate himself and soliciting secular help? He wanted a linguist to translate uh, the plates. Of course, that's a very radical uh, revision of what we thought before for the most part. Uh, what is not mentioned in any of those motives is what turned out to be the most important part of the whole trip. Namely, that Joseph Smith, through some set of clues he got from Martin Harris's narration of the event, he, it sparked Joseph to think, I am fulfilling prophecy, that the learned will not be able to translate an unlearned person has a divine calling to translate uh, a holy record. And it was that courage that Joseph Smith could suddenly break through this ignorance he had of what was really he was supposed to do that was, in the historical sense, the greatest outcome of that trip to New York City by Martin Harris. And I find that theologically quite interesting because what it suggests is that divine power is working through very small events in people's lives. After all, Joseph Smith is not there. He doesn't see this. He doesn't get any um, direct uh, account of it except from uh, Martin Harris. And he didn't know what was going to come out of this. It all occurred to him after the fact. So it suggests that divine power is working obliquely by misdirection and that if we extrapolate from this incident in Joseph's life to our own lives, it may be that the things that we think we are doing now will have some quite different significance as time goes by that there may be historical seeds being planted and an event 
and we are totally unaware until uh, things develop in the distant future. So it suggests um, for believers that we have to be alert for possibilities that what we are doing now may mean something quite different as time goes by. And only by looking back will we be, be able to understand that uh, God's hand was in it. When it comes to uh, Steve's paper, it's an excellent summary of very complicated material that uh, is difficult uh, for even the most learned scholars to put together in some coherent way. And he makes a, a very heroic effort to clear it up for us. And um, that was not satirical, Steve. I, 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 uh, it's not easy to do. And this was, I think, very useful for anyone who wants to read that. It will give them a good start in understanding these, these difficult things. And then goes on further to argue that these may have influenced Joseph Smith, but he wasn't dependent on them. And that's it for us, of course, a few, huge distinction. Well, in the process of doing this, something very significant is happening on the behind the scenes. Because what Steve is dealing with and what's involved here is how does God communicate with human beings? We know from section one of the Doctrine and Covenants that he has to communicate in the language of the people. He gives his revelations in the language of my servants, which means language that, which it means that all sorts of cultural baggage of the worldly culture, human culture, is loaded in to the communications that we're receiving from God. And there's always going to be a filter, a screen, that's going to obscure what God truly is and, and what he wants to communicate to us because he is dependent. He has to use the language we can understand. So that's the first thing he reminds us of. The second thing is, what language do you use? We're quite accustomed and we feel quite comfortable with him using biblical language and especially the Protestant interpretation of the Bible, not the interpretation that Jehovah's Witnesses would use or even Catholics would use, but the Protestant interpretation. And we use um, many uh, Protestant words. If you look up phrases in the Book of Mormon in, in books Google, you will find those phrases echoing through 19th century literature all over the place. It's a it's 19th century language. And not just biblical language, but other kinds of cultural terms like quorum or presidency or hot drinks. You have to pull in things from the, from the culture in order to communicate it all. But what Steve is doing is not only talking about that more or less acceptable kinds of language, but a new kind of language. Uh, secondarily hermeticism, but primarily masonry, that God in communicating to his prophet what the temple ceremony is, used a language that was uh, common uh, to masons and that Joseph Smith uh, uh, knew very well. And that is something that Mormons will have to adapt to, that the vocabulary that the Lord chooses to use to communicate to his prophets is not just a pure or biblical or religious vocabulary, but whatever best serves his purpose, including uh, Masonic terminology. That uh, uh, takes a little bit of doing to work our way through, but what we must remember is that even though these languages are borrowed and bring cultural baggage with them, we revise those, that language. We make it our own. It soon assumes a Mormon, or we would say perhaps a more godly form because it is used in the context of other revelations and of all the practices that Mormons use. And that is particularly true, and I think simplifies the point most sharply, with the temple. It does have Masonic language in it. There's no question about that. 
but it assumes an entirely different meaning in, in the temple ceremony than it does within masonry. So the edge is, is taken off of this realization that we're borrowing language in the fact that we can transform that language and make it truly our own. So taken together, these um, papers give us a God who is deeply implicated in history. He works through our culture after the manner of their language. And he works through small things. Great purposes are achieved obliquely through very ordinary happenings. And we may be in the, in the dark until we look back and see the hand of God in our lives. Thank you. <laughs>